So next time somebody says to you, I don't believe in God, I have a snappy answer for you. It may surprise you that I have a snappy answer for somebody. <laughs> I want you to say to them, tell me about your God, because maybe I don't believe in him either. Because isn't that the essence of the problem? Is that people don't really understand who God is. Or they have some distortion or some caricature and, and therefore they misunderstand who God is, therefore they rationalize rejecting him. And so part of the goal of the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians is to help us clearly, more clearly understand. And in some ways it's like describing colors. If you think about we're describing a God who is invisible, who is three persons and yet one God, and who has acted in all kinds of different ways in history, and, and you understand why it's difficult to really comprehend, especially with our small minds. And so, it is important for people to know who God is before they come and understand and submit their lives to Him. And then it becomes an extremely important opportunity for us for the rest of our lives to get better and better and better at clarifying what is it that we know about God. There's a, a famous pastor named A.W. Tozer, and he said, the most important thing about you is what comes to your mind when you think of God. That my picture of God begins to change everything. And so it's, it's somewhat like describing color. Now, I know if, if you are married or if you have uh, somebody you've tried to choose colors with, you, you know that men have eight colors. And you go to the paint store, and I don't know whose job it is to name a bazillion kinds of colors. You go in there and you say, I'd like a white. And they're like, well, there's 50 kinds of white. Which one would you like? <laughs> and the guy's thinking, ah, just choose that one, it's fine. And you gotta go through all these different colors. And you know, it's like, that's kind of orange. No, it's peach, maybe it's a little more coral. And the reality, guys, is there's good greens and ugly greens. There's just a whole bunch of difference between them. And the guy's thinking, camouflage green, what's wrong with that? I like it. <laughs> the point is, is the more you learn, the more you understand, the more finer shadings of understanding you have, the better you know something. And we want to get clear about God. So we're going to walk through Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to pick out things that are either direct statements or references or pictures. Because as the Bible tries to describe God for us, it uses many different images and pictures and similes that God is a father, that God is a king, that he's the conqueror, that he's a shepherd. And, and those pictures then help us get a little clearer, not only about who God is, but how we relate to him. So I'm going to pick out four, and I don't know which ones you would pick out, because in all these chapters there could be more, but I want to pick out four pictures of God, and I want to walk through them and help you see God a little more clearly. And my goal is that not only you would see God more clearly, but that you would begin to embrace, this is the picture of God that I most need to lean into right now because of the circumstances of my life, because of where I am in my spiritual development, because what, what I'm learning right now, that this is a picture of God that I most need to, to lean into. They're all clearly true, but this is the one I want to spend some time thinking about. So we're going to start with the reading the verses from Ephesians and then pulling out a picture. It says, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. So the first picture I thought, and this is a complex and a big idea, but God is rich. He is rich not only in the cattle on a thousand hills, he's rich in mercy. And mercy is the characteristic that when you deserve punishment, when you deserve to, be, to receive for what you've done terrible things, Instead, God forgives us. God doesn't give us those terrible things that we deserve. And it is a first cousin to the word grace, which goes from mercy on, and it says, not only do you not get what you do deserve in punishment, instead, I adopted you and I brought you into my family, and you who were far away, I've made you near. 
So mercy is not getting what you deserve in punishment. Grace is getting what you don't deserve in God's love and God's care and God's power in our lives. So God is rich. And that is not so clear of why that's important until we realize how badly we need it. You see, I think a lot of people's religious philosophy is I'm going to compare myself with somebody worse and I don't look that bad and I'm going to go to church once in a while to improve my moral score and I hope somehow God grades on a curve. That's the craziest idea, not biblical, not right, and dangerous. When we come in the book of Ephesians, in fact, chapter 2, as we're going to talk about next week, when we ask the question, who am I? The answer is that I am in deep, deep trouble. That without Christ, I am destined to hell. I am, and in fact, let me show you what it says. It says, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh or our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Anybody without Christ, the Bible says you are a sinner, you're dead. And here's the the result. You are deserving of wrath. You are under a sentence that says you deserve God's anger. Now that, should give us pause. You see, he he sketches in the first part of Ephesians that we were not only following Satan, but that we were living just out of whatever it was that my sinful desires want. And if you ask many people what their goal in life is, it's I want to be happy, which is the modern translation of exactly what this says. I don't care about morals. I don't care about God. I don't care about anything. I just want my life to be good for me. And he describes that and he says, because of that, God is a righteous judge, and because of that, he has to draw a line, and God is holy and perfect, and if I can say this strongly to you, God hates all sin like you and I hate what somebody would be doing if they did terrible things to a child. When we see sin like that, and we have a sort of a, an ambivalent relationship with sin, some sin we hate, some sin we tolerate, and some sin we're kind of excited about. Because that's our sinful nature, right? And if you can begin to see that God hates all sin with a terrible hatred because He's holy and because it's awful, and that He is a just judge. And, you know, the funny part we have in our relationship with the law is if you're in trouble and you've done something wrong or you were speeding or doing something more serious, going to a courtroom and standing before a judge is a not-too-fun experience, right? Because you're afraid of the punishment you might receive. However, if you've been stolen from, if somebody did something to your family, if some terrible thing was done to you, how do you go to the courtroom? I hope that judge gives them everything he can. Right? But God is not an angry person like somebody who, who just whimsically gets mad. They have a bad day. God's judgment, his punishment is absolutely just. That When we come to be punished, we would wish somebody would let us off. Like, ah, you were speeding 100 miles an hour in a school zone, but we're just going to let you off with a warning. That's what we want for ourselves. But when we want somebody else to get punishment, we want it to be the full extent of the law. And God doesn't waver like that. God is absolutely just. He does what is right. And so God has put us who are in rebellion against him, who have chosen to do our own thing instead of God's thing. He's put us in this category, he says, deserving of wrath. Now, I say that strongly because I believe that in many cases, the path of truth has ditches on both sides. And so, the true picture of God, one of the ditches is we see God as angry and he's wanting to destroy us. And if we do something wrong, he punishes us and he he enjoys it. We see God as ugly and mean, really, and we're fearful of God. The opposite ditch is, oh, God's kind of like Santa Claus. You know, he says he's going to find out who's naughty and nice, but whoever gets coal. And people say, well, God's loving and he's merciful. So I'm just going to sin and then I'll ask forgiveness later and God will be good with that. Both of those are dangerous views of God. And the truth is, is that God is a righteous judge and he's very powerful and he's totally holy. 
but he's also rich in mercy. And see, when you blend those two together, you have this amazing response of gratitude because I don't, des- I don't get what I deserve. Instead, I get God's grace. But you don't get cocky. You don't get prideful. You don't get arrogant. And you don't get the idea that God is soft on sin. Some people think God was upset about sin in the Old Testament, but now he doesn't care. Uh, he's the same God. He still cares. And so it's difficult, I think, for us. In fact, a good question for you is, which ditch do I run closer to? Am I more likely to see God as way distant and angry and therefore walk away from Him, or am I likely to justify my selfishness and my sin because I don't think God is that holy? And so as you read through the Scriptures, it keeps balancing and clarifying our view of God. And so it says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed to us, to his, in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. That we who were deserving of his wrath have come because Jesus came and because he understood the predicament. God Fully God in flesh, Jesus came and he lived a perfect life. And because of that, when he died on the cross, he could take your penalty and my penalty. And when he was raised from the dead, it was proof that God had accepted that, that the the judgment of God was fully satisfied. And that you and I don't have to stand before a holy judge based on my goodness or my badness. That we stand before a holy judge based on the goodness of Jesus that he's given to us. And if you begin to realize that, you realize that Jesus delivered it, that God is both holy and compassionate, and Jesus made that possible, that that God could be just and he could also justify us without compromising his nature, without becoming a judge who let people get away with sin because the sin was satisfied. So it's it's a very powerful and complex picture of God as somebody who's holy and yet rich in mercy. And if you get that picture, you walk in this sense of humility and gratitude and surrender. And you also walk in awareness that sin is a big deal and that we need continually to confess our sin and to have God keep cleansing us, keep keep purifying our hearts. So think about that. What is it in you need in that picture? You tend to see God as distant and angry Do you tend to see God as maybe soft on sin or do you walk in that place of humility and confession because of who God really is? Think about how it is that you see God even when you're stopping and praying to Him. The second picture in Ephesians 2.10, after he talks about that we were saved by grace through faith and that it's not of ourselves, it's a gift of God, there's this Great line, it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is a very, very powerful concept that God has not only just created human beings, He has formed and created you. He has shaped your life. He's given you the personality He gave you, the spiritual gift if you're a follower of Jesus. He's given you your abilities. He's given you your intelligence. He's given you all these things, and He's prepared created you to be a unique and wonderful handiwork, and he's doing it so that you have a clear purpose in life. So what does that, what does that mean really, that, that breakdown to? It means that God's an artist. That, that word that we say handiwork is an idea of somebody doing something beautiful and carefully crafted. And I don't know if you have any kind of art interest or art enjoyment, but there's something within us, I think, that responds to beauty. That if you think God is an artist who created the world around us and the the beauty we see in Oregon and the fall colors and the sunrises, and, and you think that is incredibly a wonderful picture of God, and you often miss the fact that God also created us so that we enjoy it. That he's made something in us that goes, wow. And that that corresponds with who God is. That he's an artist and he's created that. And he says, we are his handiwork. And the word 
comes from the word in Greek, poema. And you pretty clearly can see that that's where we get our word poem. And it means that we are a masterpiece. You see, God says we are his handiwork. And when he started with us, we were a piece of work. And God does great things with what he's got to work with. And he says, you're a masterpiece. And I don't know how many of you did your mirror speech this last week, but last weekend I challenged you to think about what God says about us and to take a few of those and to refine them and to look yourself in the mirror. Now, here's your point. I told you it was going to be on the test. How many of you did your mirror speech this week and did it at least one one day this week. Oh, you guys are better than Saturday night. <laughs> and everybody that didn't raise your hand, you have one more week. You know, you know what my mirror speech was? I am loved. I've been chosen. I'm created with exquisite precision for very specific purposes. Let me tell you, if you start your day like that, it changes your day. Right? If that's who I am, instead of just trying to figure my life out, just trying to get through, it's a completely different picture of what life is about. So if we are his handiwork, then he's an artist. And one of the pictures that God uses all the way through the scripture is that God is a potter. That's the, I think, one of the beautiful pictures of God being a creator, that he's a potter. And you know what that makes us in the picture? Dirt. Dirt. <laughs> That's a fancy word for clay. It's a particular kind of dirt. And, and I don't know if you've ever had a chance to throw a pot, to work on a potter's wheel. But let me tell you how it goes. You take this slimy bit of clay, and you, with all your precision, try to put it right in the middle of this wheel that's spinning. And you never get it. And so you put your hands on it, you get them all wet, and you put on, you kind of lock your fingers, and you kind of put your elbow on your knee, and you get there, and first of all, the clay goes like this. And ironically, when you're new at it, the more you try to get it centered, the worse it gets. And it's called getting it centered. And finally, if you learn to do it right and you get it there, it quits fighting you. Some of you need to hear that word today. God's the potter and he's trying to create something beautiful in your life and he can't get you centered. And as long as you're fighting him, he can't do anything. And we need to say, okay, God, every morning I need to be centered (laughs) because I get kind of erratic and I need to get back centered. And then God uses the pressures of our life inside and outside. And if you've ever watched a potter work, it's this incredible living process where he uses pressure and sometimes tools to bring it up and sometimes there's a hard piece of clay that gets stuck and so he has to stop and cut it out which if you imagine yourself as the piece of pottery it's probably not very fun and does God do that in our lives does he trim things out does he find hard spots and the pressures of life and the things and and I love the picture if you've ever done this the pressure on the outside has to equal the pressure on the inside for it not to collapse And God is creating something beautiful. And I like the picture of pottery because pottery is not only beautiful, it's useful. You do something with it. That's the problem with a lot of artwork is after you get it done, what do you do with it? Except hang it on a wall or do it for display. But, But pottery is useful and God loves to work with us. And when that pottery quits fighting, he's not only able to make it into a beautiful piece of work, he is able to let that purpose that he created us for begin to be realized in our daily life. That the fact that God wants to use us is the highest compliment. And what's amazing is how much great things he can do considering the dirt he's got to work with. And you take a piece of pottery and you look at it and it started as mud in the ground and it become this beautiful, exquisite thing that can be not only beautiful but functional. I got a chance after college to go on a trip of Europe and go down to Israel. And one of the things we stopped in, one of the most famous museums in the world called the Louvre in France. And uh, I got to see the Mona Lisa and the Venus de Milo and some famous things that you only see in books. And, And one of the things that caught my attention, and I took this picture of an art student, obviously an advanced art student, 
watching the masters, taking a look at the masterpiece and trying to recreate that. And I thought that that's appropriate, that the artistry of God is something we should learn how from God's artistry, learn how to help shape each other. That we are people helping people find and follow Jesus. And when you see God is working in you in wonderful ways, then it should inspire you and encourage you and teach you how it is that we can help each other and work in each other's lives. Because God uses us as the ones who live according to his purposes to help shape each other. That God is working individually with us, but he's also working in our lives through, our, through each other in those, in those delicate processes of creating his masterpiece. So God is the judge. He's rich in mercy. God is an artist who is creating in us, with us, a beautiful masterpiece that he wants to use. In the next picture, it says, For he himself is our peace, who's made the two groups one and who's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Now, there's some things you may not understand there to begin with, but let me just draw your attention to that simple idea. Who is God? He is our peace. You see, there's, there's two parts of it. First of all, he allowed us, Jesus, through Jesus, there is peace between us and God. We started off and we were under wrath, and because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we have been made so that we can become into the presence of God. And this is a picture of the Jewish temple. And it had, had a big wall on the outside. It has a wall here. It has a further court. And finally, you get into the temple itself. And inside that is the 10 by 10 room called the Holy of Holies. And that is in the Old Testament, their place where they were to worship God and where the presence of God touched down. And there were so many barriers between the ordinary person and God. In fact, there's this wall around here, and it divided what was called the court of the Gentiles. If you're not Jewish by ethnicity or extraction, then you are a Gentile, everybody else. And it says, not only are you excluded, they, in their archaeological findings, they found this stone, which was part of that wall. And it says, any, first of all, you had to be not only a Jewish person, you had to be clean. And anybody else who tries to get in that, it says, we're not responsible for your death. Yeah, this was the original survivors will be shot. So, so there was a severe warning that said, you can't come here. And it was not only between us and God, it was between the Jewish people and the Gentiles who couldn't go any closer than that. And this beautiful picture that God brought peace, it wasn't just like, whoa, isn't that a nice, wonderful, sunny morning? No, it's, he destroyed the hostility. He destroyed the wall. He destroyed the wall that holds Gentiles back. He destroyed, in fact, in Jesus' resurre- or Jesus crucifixion, the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. The way is now open and that Jesus has destroyed what has kept us back from being in close fellowship with God. So he's made peace with all of those who would come and surrender to Jesus and it's made peace between us and God. And because of that, he not only brings peace with God, he also helps us make peace with each other. You see, it would have been so easy in the early church for there to be a Jewish church and there to be a Gentile church. There was great differences. The Jews had thought of the Gentiles as dogs, as idolaters, as profane. I mean, every ugly thought, they thought, if you weren't Jewish, you weren't, you weren't anything. And so, for them to be brothers and sisters in Christ, for them to be the same, for them to come and be united closely, was an incredible difficulty. And you see that all through the New Testament, there was a a tendency for the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers to be in friction. But the peace of God, and there's a beautiful verse in Philippians 4 that says that God God is the God of peace, and then three verses later it says, if you respond to him, the peace of God will be on your life. You see, he is a God who brings peace where there is no peace. 
And so the peace of God that we have in our relationship with God should then begin to flow out into how we relate to each other. And you know the Bible talks clearly about how important unity and harmony is. How important it is between husband and wife. How important it is in your nuclear family. How important it is in a church family. And we are to pursue it and we are to protect it because peace can be shattered in an instant. I don't know how it is in your house, but my wife and I are not always at peace. You know, you can go from everything's fine, the house is nice, our health is good, our situation is good, and we're enjoying life. And you know, she just says one thing wrong. You can tell she's not in the service, can't you? (laughs) Or I just say something wrong. And you know what? The air conditioning or the heating still works fine. The house is the same. Our financial condition is the same. Our health is the same. You know what's not there? Peace. And it shatters so easily. And the scriptures say peace comes from God. And when I have my relationship and I'm at peace with God, it says that it's supposed to bleed out into how I treat others. In fact, Romans chapter 12 says that as much as it's possible at us, we are to be at peace with whom? Everyone. You mean that boss I've got? You mean that ex-spouse I've got? You mean that neighbor? God, you don't understand the people I've got to deal with. You know how we really read that? We're supposed to be at peace with nice people. You know, it's interesting. The Bible doesn't call us to be peace enjoyers. It calls us to be peacemakers. And so I ask you to pause and think, am I at peace with God in my relationship with him? Do I sense his peace, the fact that he loves me and that he's drawing me in and that I can walk with him? And then does that peace leak out of me everywhere I go? When you go to school, when you go to work, when you come home, is there a sense of peace that comes with you because of your relationship with Christ? Or do you bring agitation and selfishness and frustration and tension? What do you bring when you come into a room? So I'd ask you to pause and say, do I understand that God is the God of peace and that the closer I get to him, the more I walk in peace and in harmony and unity? And that that's so valuable. That's so important. The fourth picture. Move down the chapter, Ephesians 2.14. It says, consequently, because he is our peace, because he's created us, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. You see how some of the pictures of God are really clear and some of them I've had to kind of tease out from the passage? He says he is our chief cornerstone. So again, here's another picture for us to understand. Last week we talked about that we are the body of Christ, that we are like the hands and feet and fingers and toes of, and Jesus is the head of the body. That's how we're connected. Here it uses the motif of a building, that we are built together and that we are to be, in fact, a a building in which God lives by His Spirit. And it's supposed to be this idea that we were no longer outsiders. We're no longer enemies with God and with each other. We're now all built together. But the critical piece, he says, is you're built with Jesus as the cornerstone. Now, we don't build a lot with block anymore or with stones, but the cornerstone is the most important stone in the whole building. And in Israel, uh, not only today, but I mean, not only ancient, but today, they milled a lot of their buildings out of limestone. In fact, it's uh, a law in the city of Jerusalem. You have to cover things with limestone, even if they're built about, out of something else, which makes Jerusalem a beautiful city. And limestone is a unique medium in which, when it's in the ground, it's fairly soft rock. You can actually cut it with saws. And so it makes it easy to make them square. 
And when you take them out of the ground and you let the air hit them, it hardens the limestone and it becomes an ideal building medium. So they, the story goes, and this is a, not a biblical story but a tradition, that when they were building Solomon's temple, they didn't want hammering and chiseling to be on the site of the worship of God, so they did it in the quarries. And they would cut the stones and they would number them and then they would transport them and they were to be put together on the site. And the tradition is, and the story goes, that they were bringing all these stones but they couldn't find the cornerstone. And the cornerstone is the very first block that you put in. And it's the most important because it sets the level at which the whole building is going to be. It sets square it sets plumb. You know, there's a lot of ways for one block to be out of whack. And if the one block is out of whack, then the whole building gets to be that way. Kind of like remodeling an old home. You know how that goes? So they were trying to find the cornerstone, and they were looking through all these other stones, and they realized that the cornerstone hadn't been marked, and it had gotten set aside. And so when they brought the cornerstone in, they could set it in place, and they could be, again, the building of the temple. And Jesus refers to himself as the cornerstone that was rejected. You see, the Jewish people did not see that he was the cornerstone and they rejected him. And then he calls himself either the stone of stumbling or the stone in which people step up on. And so he's, he refers to himself as the chief cornerstone, which means that as God is developing us, as he's building his masterpiece in us, Everything as you grow as a Christian, everything in your life as you mature, as you become more useful, we need to be more and more and more like Jesus. You see, the whole point of God's work in us is to bring us into alignment with the character of Jesus, with the purposes of Jesus, with the lifestyle of Jesus, that we are to line our lives up. And listen carefully, it's easy for us to begin to look at other people to look at other organizations. It's, begin, it's easy for us to begin to build our lives around other things. And every now and then, God will shake your life and you will have to go back to say, my life has to be built around Jesus. He is the only cornerstone. Four pictures of God. And I'm gonna hand off to Green and uh, South Umqua and Pastor Will and Pastor Sky if you just wanna walk through that and how that applies in your particular campus. I want you to put your papers away. I want you to think as we think of this week. And on your sheet, instead of writing next steps, I just wrote this week. And uh, for those of you who haven't done your mirror speech, write mirror speech on there right there, would you? But let me ask you this question. Which picture of God do you need most in your life for what's going on right now? Do you need to see God as rich in mercy and grace? Some of us torture ourselves with sins from the past, with shame, with embarrassment, with disappointing people, and we live in that sense of, I can never please God, I'm working really hard, it's never enough. And you need to finally see that God is rich in mercy and grace. He's so rich, it covers all of your sins. Maybe you need that. Some of you need to see God as an artist, and he's shaping you in the circumstances of your life. He's trying to create something of beauty, but you're still fighting him. And you need to knock it off. You need to let God center you. You need to say, okay, God, I'm going to surrender and let you do what you're wanting to do. You know, it's hard for us to let go of control, isn't it? And maybe some of you need that. Some of you, you need to see God as the peace in your life, that he is the one who brings peace. And there are people that are at war with you or that you're at war with or you're struggling with. And you need to go back and get your peace from God. And then you need to live his peace out in the home that you're in, in the situation that you're in, in the school you're in, or the place you work. And that you need to see God as the source of peace that you desperately need. And for some of you, your life has been out of alignment and you've been trying to please other people and you've been trying to do things maybe even just to fit in with the church and you need to say, oh yeah, there's an audience of one. I need to get back to being in alignment with Jesus and I need to let him work in me. 
So on your sheet there next week, would you write the picture of God that you most need to lean into? And I want you to do some thinking about it and some exploring and maybe reading. Find other places where peace is mentioned or cornerstone is mentioned or, or God being the potter and, and begin to lean into that for yourself so that you can embrace the picture of God that you most need for this moment in your life. And I know that that's a very powerful idea because sometimes we get a list of 20 things that are true about God and we get this fuzzy picture that doesn't really help us focus. And so I want you to focus what are those pictures that you need of God and how does that impact your life right now? Let's pray. Father, thank you for how the scripture clearly designates who you are and lets us understand more and more and more as we walk through this process of the subtleties and the beauties and the intricacies and the nuances of your character and how we relate to that and how it impacts our lives. And Father, if there's anybody here today that has never surrendered to you, they're, they're not even on the potter's wheel. I pray that because of your goodness and your grace, they would have the, the courage and the faith to come forward and just to pray wherever you're sitting right now. Just pray, God, I want you to come into my life and to forgive my sins and to, to begin to shape my life into the design that you have in mind that I want to find the destiny that you've prepared me for. And Father, for those of us who are followers of yours, help us to understand you more clearly, to lean in better, so that we, our lives are impacted by who you are and that our behavior comes out from an inside relationship with you, not from an outside peer pressure from somebody else. And God, we want to know you better. Open the eyes of our heart that we might see who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me or if you'd like to let us know, um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.